up now. So, thank you for showing up. <laughs> and welcome to this talk about the KD framework support. Uh, so my name is uh, Kevin Ottens, and you probably don't need me, so that picture, that's an old version of me. Um, I've been working on KD since 2003, uh, so basically I've been doing that more than a third of my life now, um, and I love that. Uh, I hope that you like acronyms. Um, so I got a PhD in artificial intelligence in 2007, and because of that, I'm still teaching in the uh, local university in Toulouse, so that the Paul Sabatier uh, University. And since I have to pay my bills, I also uh, work for a company named KDAB, uh, which is specialized in consulting around Qt. Um, so that gives me both a perspective of the needs of Qt developers uh, within the community, but also commercial developers. Um, and since I'm not that interesting, we'll move into the purpose of that uh, of that talk. And in there, I will try basically to answer uh, three uh, big questions on the what. What are we talking about when we talk about KDE frameworks? Uh, why are we doing that in the first place? And then how uh, are we we are getting toward uh, turning that into uh, into a product, um, both on the technical side, so what we changed uh, technically in what we already had to create it, and uh, also on the community side, uh, because we changed a bit in the way we uh, we work. So. Most of you probably uh, probably know uh, KDE, or at least you think you know uh, what KDE is. Um, so. What well, things that was German project that's basically a very ugly name, which was a cool desktop environment, but cool with K, right? Because it was German. Um, and quickly we move to the acronym, right? But the point is that KDE used to be a single product, uh, as the name implies. That used to be a desktop environment. But the thing is, we kept producing more and more stuff until we had to split. Uh, to split up to manage the complexity of what we, we were doing. And so now KD is at uh, the community and we make plenty of products. So in effect, that means that KD is uh, a vendor brand and then we make products. And among those products, there's one that most people ignore, uh, which is KD Ellipse. So that's one of the products we used to make. It kind of grew organically from the rest of the work we were doing uh, in the KDE community. It is a fairly big package, um, and it contains several libraries, but even though that several libraries are kind of um, depending on each other, so there's quite a bit of dependencies going on in there. And on top of that, uh, when you start using things coming from KDE libs, you very often end up with uh, runtime dependencies, demand, demand being started, and so on. Um, and clearly, because of that, there was not many adoptions inside of the other uh, overall Qt developer community of what we were producing. And so it's because of those flows that we thought that, yeah, maybe we should uh, do things differently around KD Ellipse, and uh, that's why we came up with this idea of KD frameworks now. Um, another reason for that is that around the same time, Qt5, uh, Qt5 was coming, and since that was a major version, new version of Qt, that was a good time for us to start uh, changing the API, uh, breaking the binary compatibility, and so on, and effectively making that into a new, uh, a new product. And in 2011, we had a meeting named uh, the Platform 11 meeting, um, and that's uh, in Rwanda, in Switzerland, and that's where we took some decisions on how we would proceed with that. Um, we wanted to make something which was more manageable and clearly an alternative to uh, what was KD Ellipse. Um, and what we wanted there was not uh, a fairly big package like we had with KD Ellipse, but we wanted a set of frameworks uh, and the plural, and we wanted each of those frameworks to be lean and mean, right? Okay, so self contained and very easy to reuse in different contexts. And immediately, when you 
start changing your focus like that and you want to make a new product that asks the question of what is the audience of my, uh, of my new product? And well, obviously part of that audience that was the existing, K uh, that's the existing KD developers. Um, and so because of that, we need to cover existing other products needs like the desktop, like the different applications we are making. Um, but that was also a good time to maybe target larger, right? To target some more people that we weren't targeting with, uh, with KDE Libs. And uh, obviously what we want with KDE Frameworks is not only to, um, to uh, cater the needs of the KDE developers, but also to take care of the um, third party Qt application developers. And since we have that audience that asks a question of what are their needs, right? So we have two, uh, two groups inside there. So we have the KD developers, and so their needs are basically uh, continuity, right? They, they want continuity because they were using KD libs and they want to keep using that uh, for their applications, otherwise they would have to break quite a lot of things. Um, and so, that's why we are, we are bringing on board some compatibility APIs, uh, APIs um, which we group into a secondary product that we call supporting aids. And that's what they will use to be able to move from the KD libs world to the KD frameworks world. Um, that's also why uh, we will provide strong binary compatibility, uh, well, or at least source compatibility for them. And Recently in the KD community, KD developers community, we've seen more and more people um, not using some part of KD libs because they wanted to have something which was easy to, uh, to make portable, uh, something which was easy to deploy, and because of the flows we had uh, in KD libs that I mentioned earlier, that was harder than needed. So we also need to look at that uh, portability and deployment uh, issue as a new need which arise into uh, our current users. And then next to that, we have the third party Qt developer needs. And for those ones, uh, the needs they have that's mainly uh, faster time to market, right? They want to have to take uh, a building block and that building block to solve their problem, okay? So that's one of the things they need. The other strong need they have is, again, portability and ease of deployment, right? So there's clearly an, uh, an overlap between those two groups. Um, and with frameworks, that's kind of getting into a space where we start to, um, to consider them as a single group of user and not something specific. Uh, in, in some way, with, uh, with KDE frameworks, uh, from the framework's develop, uh, developer point of view, uh, the former KDE developers or the new third-party uh, Qt developers, they are um, kind of the same type of user. Okay? We are not really making any difference anymore, apart from uh, the continuity, which is an extra that we provide to KDE developers. Um, yeah. And for the Qt, uh, Qt developers, another need they have is that those blocks, they need to be very, very easy to reuse. And that means not forcing on them uh, the build system we're using, okay? Previously, when you're using KDE libs, you're basically forced into using CMake, right? But most of the uh, Qt developers, third-party Qt developers, they, um, they use QMake. And we didn't really provide any easy bridge for them to, uh, to use that, and that's something we can uh, put on board. Yep. So we just decided to go ahead and do that um, because that's pretty much about taking what we add with KDE libs, um, modifying the architecture to make it more modular, adding some more tooling on top, right? And we would be able to cater uh, the needs of, uh, of both, both groups. So put that way, that sounds easy, right? Well, it took three years, um, and the main task we've been, uh, we've been going on first, that was the splitting work. Um, that's because the splitting, that's the way for us to, uh, to provide that modularity and to uh, start to explode the big blocks we had, 
And that, because of that, we are creating more and more different blocks instead of only having a few. And that means we need to have means for the dependency management. And since we have to manage those dependencies, that we also need means to communicate those dependencies to our potential users. And so for that, we put in place uh, a system of what we call tiers and types. So the idea is that every framework we produce in the KDE Frameworks uh, product is placed into a box, okay, which label it with a tier and with a type. So for the tiers, we have what we call the tier one. And for tier one frameworks, they are allowed to depend only on Qt or libraries which are in the underlying system, and that's it. For the tier two uh, frameworks, then they are allowed to depend only on Qt, only on system libraries, and on tier one libraries. Okay, so that's our second tier. So we have the second layer. And for the tier three, that's the same thing than tier two, and it it can also depend on tier two uh, frameworks and on tier three frameworks. I will have a diagram about that in a couple of slides to make it clearer. So that's the tiers. And the types on the other end, that's another uh, axis in the way we manage the dependencies. Because we use the tiers as dependencies overall. Okay? So if you pick a block, you know how much stuff you're pulling with it. Okay? With the types, that's uh, a different aspect because of those dependencies that might be fine to, uh, to bring on board some more libraries than you would need. But sometimes, especially if you're doing something embedded, you might not want to have runtime dependencies. Okay? So that's what the types are about. That's what's the amount of runtime dependencies I will bring on, bo on board if I'm picking that particular framework. And so, three types we identified, that's functional add-ons. So those ones have no runtime dependency whatsoever. Okay? They're just pure, uh, pure libraries. Then we have what we call the integration add-ons. Those ones might have some optional runtime dependencies. We call them integration because in practice that means they provide some plugin system or they provide some demand somewhere to be able to integrate in a given operating system. Okay? So this type of uh, framework they use in native abilities of the platform is that available. And if nothing is available, that's especially the case on, uh, on Linux in the end, if nothing is available, then it provides an extra plugin or it provides an extra daemon. And then we have what we call the solutions. So solutions, those ones, they will have mandatory runtime dependencies, but that's the point. That's because the added value of that framework comes from the runtime dependency, okay? Because that's part of the design. Um, for instance, we have the KIO system that's multi-process, so you have a daemon and you spawn extra processes and so on, that's runtime dependencies. But that's here to ensure uh, the safety of your main process. Okay, so if something crashes somewhere, then your main process won't go away. That's part of uh, of the purpose of that one. That's why we consider that a solution. So that means our goal was to move from a world like that. So we had only one big package, which was named KDLib. That's fine if you can't read the, the diagram. That's just to make the point. You don't need to read it. Um, just one big package, KD Libs. Inside there, we have a few, maybe smaller blocks, but there's tight dependencies and there's no communication going on about which dependencies they have, so you're kind of left on your own. So we wanted to move from that world to that one. Okay? So I said we have three tiers and we have three types. So that basically means we have nine boxes, okay, inside of the frameworks. And each of those boxes, so you can have then frameworks uh, in them. But then it's clear what you can or cannot uh, depend on when you're a framework developer, or you know the amount of stuff you're potentially pulling when you're a user. Okay? So if I take the middle block, for instance, in the middle block, I would have all the frameworks which are uh, integration add-ons and which are tier two. So because of that, they can depend only on integration, uh, integration add-ons, which are tier one. Okay, that's the tier rule. I can go down, and I can go to the right. Okay, I can have 
uh, if I'm an integration add-on, I have some non-mandatory um, runtime dependencies. So that's perfectly fine to use something which has no runtime dependency whatsoever. Okay. Um, yeah. So that's that's the way we uh, we communicate all dependencies. So we are moving from that single being block to having nine uh, different blocks, um, and much clearer dependencies uh, communicated. A nice side effect of that is that it can be consider considered like maturity model as well, because each framework, when we release it, uh, we allocate it a tier and a type. But nothing says that this tier and this type should stay the same for the years to come. Um, and so what we expect will happen is that the framework developers can use that as a guide for improvement. Okay? Um, and that, that's because we start measuring new things we didn't measure, and you basically can improve only what you measure. Otherwise, you have no idea. Okay? So we can perfectly imagine if we have something which is in the middle group, uh, that their developers can set a target of saying, OK, that's tier, uh, tier 2 for now, but maybe, maybe we can do some extra work to actually get it down and make it a tier one. Okay? And by doing that, they make it even more desirable for third-party Qt developers. Okay? Because those ones, they know that they can pick it directly if they use Qt. So that's a way also to guide our frameworks developers to have something which is even more and more modular over time, okay? and even more and more reusable for Qt developers. So that has a question of, well, which blocks do we have, right? Well, we, we started with only a handful of libraries in KDE Libs, and now we have lots of blocks. Uh, and by lots, I mean that we have right now 52 of them. So we moved from having only a handful to 52 different blocks, uh, which, has, which are way more independent and which have a clear uh, feature scope uh, compared to previously. Um, and so I will just focus a couple of minutes on uh, a couple of tier one examples. So the first one uh, I will mention, that's K-Archive. Um, so K-Archive, that's a tier one, so it depends only on Qt Core and some low level libraries like uh, BZ2, for instance. Uh, it comes with unit tests because we want to have a strong push for our automated unit tests in all of our frameworks, so it comes with that. Um, and it's on top of that, it's uh, built with CMake, but, and that's the interesting part, it's um, usable uh, with QMake if you want to. Okay, So I will try to... So the problem is that I'm not seeing what I'm typing because otherwise you wouldn't see. So I will try to read from there, but I'm not sure my site would be good enough for it. We'll see. I'm getting old, apparently. Okay, so I get the right one. So you probably can't read that, but is that better now? Okay. You can read that or? Yep. Okay. So. So the idea is to make that easy to reuse, right? Um, so I prepared a K-Archive uh, table, and so we want to have very simple workflow for people you know, getting started. So you just incorporate that, get in there, see make. Build. and check that everything is right. Okay, So that's why we come with uh, unit tests for everything we produce. That's a guide for us. That's also a guide for people reusing to actually know if that's working. Okay. At that point, I just have to make the make install to put that in my system, and then I can um, walk away and start to use that. So I won't do the make install, because I obviously already have it on my computer. Uh, but that's a, just a very standard package using CMake. Okay? Nothing complicated there to reuse it. Then that asks a question about if I have a project. So let's assume I'm working on some small dumb, uh, dumb project. Okay, So I'm working on a small dumb archiver uh, application. So I will prove how dumb that is. Um, if I run it, and 
if I run it, yep. Like to have it on screen, please. Where is my pointer? Okay, that's interesting. Ooh, what's going on? Okay, doesn't want to be. Okay, so that will make it short. Hold on. Oh, here it is. It finally decided to show up. And I don't see my pointer, and that's annoying. Okay, so let's assume I'm running it. And so the idea of the archiver is that I pick a file, I pick a destination, and I say, okay, archive, which at that point just copies the file. Uh, if I'm making an archiver and I have something like that immediately, okay, that's only the very premise of an application I could write, uh, immediately the problem I would have as a cute uh, third-party cute developer would be, okay, I archive, but how do I compress my archiving? So I could reinvent the wheel because cute provide nothing there. Okay, I could reinvent the wheel or look at what we have in the KDE frameworks and see if I can reuse that. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do there. So I will stop that guy and I will get back to Qt Creator, okay? So I'm using Qt Creator there and I should have, okay. And so I have a profile. So that project doesn't use uh, CMake at all. It, use, it uses QMake because that's potentially what a third party Qt application developer would be doing. And saying that I want to use K Archive in my project is as easy as saying I want to use one of the Qt modules, okay? If you were used to adding more modules to your Qt project, just by saying Qt plus equal and the name of the Qt module, that's basically exactly the same for uh, reusing something like K-Archive, okay? So if I do that, I can then build. No, I can build, I want to build. I have focus management issue there. Hold on. I don't see what I'm clicking on. So. Okay, save. Okay, so now that I built it, I can start using stuff coming from K archive, okay, so I can include K compression device. Okay, and I can say, okay, now I want to suffix that with BZ2. And I will replace my DOM copy with Q file source, uh, the source name. And then source pen Q file read only same thing for the destination, which is now a compression device destination destination name. Then Q5, uh, sorry, and then K compression device B Z two. Okay, and then I can open that in write only mode. And so, oop. and if I'm not at the end of my source file, okay, then in my destination, 
I write what I get from the tools. Which would be a read read of a few bytes. And if I didn't make any mistake, and I did mistakes, and I can't read them, ah, so what did I do there? 41, forgot what? 41, 41, but that's one. Ah, OK. Stupid me. Which one? <laughs> oh, you know what? I will just get it there for a second. OK, so I'm green. Oh, yeah, okay. That's much better when I can read when I type. Ah, uh, okay. So I build it. And that's basically it, right? Uh, now if I run it, I get it there. Where is my pointer again? Ah, too much. Sure, no, it's there. Oops. Okay, so I want that as well, and I want that guy. Okay, so here we go again. If I pick make fire, I pick my destination. Okay, and if I archive, now I get an extra file, but this one is uh, actually an archive, okay? So I didn't lie, that's kind of a small and uh, dub example. That's just to give you a feel of the workflow you would use to be able to reuse something in uh, directly from Qt Creator, okay? So that's basically, I mean, as we've seen, that's basically just having um, an extra module into your Qt uh, variable, and then you can uh, start and hack away and start using uh, using some of the code, some of the classes we we provide. Um, and again, in a much smaller and more modular uh, approach uh, than before. In the KD libs world, if you wanted to reuse something like KArchive, you would have needed to migrate your own project to using CMake. You would have then pulled dependencies. Uh, because you would have the compression uh, scheme, you would have the config system, you would have everything uh, under the sun while right there you get only what you uh, only what you requested. So because we exploded everything, okay, we get more modules. So we have uh, kconfig, which is portable setting management, which comes with some code generation and so on. We have solid, which is for hardware discovery and power management. We have Threadweaver. Uh, which is high-level multi-threading framework, which is job-based uh, and that provides uh, queue management, that provides um, advanced constraints um, because you can have dependencies between your threads and stuff like that, and more of that. As I said, uh, I'm just giving a handful of examples there. I just gave four examples, um, but there's 52 of them, okay? Um, so I gave only four examples, which are tier one, but in tier one, we have 20 different frameworks already. Uh, in the tier two, we have eight more of that, and, and the rest, that, uh, that's tier three. So that's quite a bit, uh, if you're a cute developer, that's quite a bit of those you know, small payloads that you can bring in your project and which solve the problem. Uh, compression, um, managing my threads, uh, doing hardware discovery, and so on and so on. So that was mostly for the technical change, but when you have such technical changes, what happens is that at one point you also get community changes, okay? So just by changing the way we perceive KDE Libs, 
um, we we changed uh, we changed the way that we uh, we are doing the work uh, inside of the community. So I will leave uh, a bit the technicalities on the side, and now we will focus on that. So one of the changes which happened in the community, which was necessary, and clearly a prerequisite to a change, that the Qt project. Uh, before the Qt project, Qt the software okay was um, was free software because of the uh, of the license right but the governance was completely closed okay you couldn't really contribute to Qt and so they set up the Qt project which now allows everyone to contribute to Qt and everyone that includes us okay uh, so that allowed us to change a bit the mindset and not just be in the Okay, let's reuse Qt, but move from that let's reuse Qt into this let's work with Qt. Okay, and so we started to upstream stuff, uh, and nowadays we are uh, contributing quite a lot of code to Qt itself, and that was necessary because to solve some of the interdependencies we had between uh, our libraries. Uh, we needed to move some of the code inside of Qt to solve them. Okay, we we found out that quite some of the code we had in KD libs was there for historical reason because we couldn't put it in Qt. But those historical reasons, they are not valid anymore. Okay, so then we could take that, move it into Qt, and suddenly some of the dependencies which are just creating troubles for us when were not there anymore. Okay, we could depend directly on Qt. Um, yeah. In the same way, we contributed things which are not directly uh, related to um, to the dependencies. But since we use CMake, we also contributed the necessary to make it easier to use Qt from CMake. Okay? So nowadays, uh, Qt is still built with QMake, but it produce produces and installs files that are then used by CMake. Okay? So that's a new feature in Qt that got contributed by us. Um, and that us upstreaming mindset actually Propagated to some other areas. So we, since we are using CMake quite a lot, we started to contribute to CMake as well. Okay. So we provided new modules for CMake uh, with maintainers. We also uh, participated in the development of new features. So there's more um, more declarative functionalities uh, features now in CMake, which are contributed by uh, KD developers. We also created. Um, what's called the extra CMake modules. That's for modules which are not meant to be in CMake directly, okay, so that's kind of an intermediate step. Uh, so that's not in CMake upstream, but still that's a neutral ground for anyone to contribute uh, to contribute CMake modules. Another of those um, community change that the fact that now we have uh, more maintainers. And the fact that we have more maintainers, that's clearly an impact of the splitting. Because previously, the maintenance model of KDLibs, that was a bit, you have this big KDLibs blob there. Okay? And now you're, uh, you're the maintainer of that class here in that big blob. And so that was hard for people to actually feel responsible for that, okay? because they were responsible for a class somewhere that maybe they would touch here and there, but, uh, but not much. And at one point, they would forget about it and not touch it anymore. But now, since we split KDLibs into those plenty of different modules, that's much easier to tell someone, OK, now you're maintaining that framework. Okay. And then that's something which is easier to actually feel responsible for. Okay, that's kind of a middle ground between that big blob and just a single class. Okay, you have something intermediate now, which are those modules, and so people can feel responsible for it. And so now we have uh, many more maintainers that we had previously because of that. Um, and since we have more maintainers, that means that we have a much better bus factor. Okay. Um, Previously, we were quickly going to, the, to a place where the maintenance model for KDLibs that was uh, David4 as maintainer by default. Okay, so if David4 gets run over by a bus, then suddenly we are not able to do anything. Uh, but now, since we have plenty of modules and each of those modules having uh, having maintainers, uh, we are spreading the risk. Okay, not only on one person, but on uh, plenty of uh, persons. 
So we had technical changes, and those technical changes cha uh, had implications on the community. And if you change something in the community, that probably means that in turn you will have changes in the practices. And that's what happened again. Okay, so that's interesting to see this dynamic going from okay, I change the technical uh, the technical constraints I have on my product, and then they will cascade all the way to how we uh, we actually do the work. So we experimented on practices because we needed to attract uh, more people to get more maintainers. Uh, so we started for a while with the volunteer days. Uh, that's something we stopped since then, uh, but we had, that was once a month in the beginning, once a month we had some kind of virtual meeting on IRC uh, where people would didn't necessarily work on KD Lips previously, could volunteer to give a hand, and we would provide with tasks they could, uh, they could try to solve. Um, we don't run those volunteer days uh, anymore for the time being, maybe we'll do that again later on. Um, but that had a clear impact on the way we distributed the work inside of the effort. Okay? While previously it was hard to give something to someone to do, and that's why we ended up with a smaller and smaller bus factor in some way, that forces, uh, forced us into splitting more of the task into fine-grained stuff, which was actually easier for people uh, to pick, uh, and we kept doing that. Okay, so. Even though we are not running the volunteer days, if you go to the wikis uh, where we manage the work uh, inside of the community, there's a lot of small tasks that uh, people can pick. And so you can come and pick some of those tasks and help there. Okay? So that's much, uh, I mean, in the KD community, KD Libs was kind of the very scary beast you know, in the dark corner that you would use but never touch, right? Uh, but now, since we forced ourselves because of the volunteer days uh, to attract people, and now that's actually something which is manageable okay, by the splitting and by having those uh, smaller tasks. We also introduced some uh, weekly progress meetings. So that's uh, meetings we have every week uh, on IRC. And everyone who participates in the KD Frameworks effort can come there and share, okay, I Past week, I've been doing that and that, and that's a good way to, you know, create this team dynamic so that people feel really part of a team, even though they work on different frameworks. That's a good way also to vent and share the frustration sometimes. Uh, that's definitely something we keep uh, we keep doing. That's also a good way for us to have an easy way to communicate with the wider KDE community. Okay, um, because someone who is working on an application doesn't necessarily track very closely what's happening in KD frameworks. So that's a good way for us to communicate the result of those meetings to them, and so they can get a feel of what's coming next, okay, and what they will be able to use and so on. And we also borrowed uh, quite a bit of practices from the agile and craftsmanship uh, expert communities. Um, so that's uh, kind of a pet interest of mine, so that explains why uh, we ended up doing that. Uh, and so we picked techniques like the definition of done, that is not just putting, not just putting a task somewhere or a, a big feature, but also describe, okay, what are the criteria to, to actually consider that as done? Okay? Very often we just jot down an idea somewhere, but we don't really know when we stop, right? There, that gives a clear end to, to the work. Uh, we also grouped our task into epics. We pushed for peer reviews uh, of the code. We have more conventions in the way we organize the different frameworks than we had in KDE Libs. Um, we also push for the continuous integration and for the automated tests. So there's uh, quite more tests which are run, run more often that, uh, than before in KDE Libs. Um, Still, there's a lot more to do, like having uh, finer granularity in the way we introduce the features, or even more tests, etc. Uh, but already, we can see a raise, in, uh, a raise in the quality level of what's going, coming out of K the KD framework's effort compared to, uh, to KD Libs. So I said that in that talk, I would try to answer three questions, okay, the what, why, and how. Uh, hopefully, at that point, uh, if you still pay attention, you might have a fourth question in your mind, uh, which is a when. When can, 
when can I get my hands on that and when I can start using it? Well, hopefully you're asking yourself that. Um, and the good news is that we released uh, Beta 2. Um, so we prepared it last week. And if everything goes well, because I didn't have, the in, uh, I didn't have access to internet this morning and my mail, but I'm supposedly having an, an email which tells me that uh, the Beta 2 packages are available. So since this morning, you're supposedly able to install packages from your distribution or get the sources and get that and hack away, okay? So we try to coordinate so that people at Fizzle could uh, have that uh, in their hands this morning. But okay, that's a beta, but that's not the final. One will be the final. Okay, so not immediately. Uh, we'll have a beta three in June because the paint is fresh on a couple of areas and we wanted to have a bit more time so that uh, it's actually uh, getting in even better shape. So in one month, we'll get a beta three. And one month after that, so in July, we'll have the 5.0, uh, 5 okay? So in less than two months, uh, we'll have the KD Frameworks 5 uh, final release out the door. And then you might wonder when will be 5.1? Why it will be in August, okay? So we are basically, so that's not that far either, okay? Um, we are basically moving into a monthly release cycle for, uh, for the KD Frameworks. So that will be August, September, and so on. So at the start of every month, there will be a new uh, KD Frameworks release. Um, planned. And for each of those, so we'll, have, uh, we'll add some more features into the existing modules, but we will also introduce more, uh, more modules. Okay? So we build up on the 52 modules we have, and we will start to get on board uh, the people from um, working on the PIM space. Okay? So the libraries we have in KD PIM libs, they will slowly move uh, inside KDE frameworks as well, okay? So you will get even more modules which allow you to, I don't know, implement the IMAP protocol or deal with email, uh, iCal, and so on, uh, that will come and will be provided by uh, KDE frameworks directly in 5.1, 5.2, and so on. And so I'm basically uh, done with that talk, so if you have questions, uh, I will try to answer them, and obrigado. So any questions or I bored you to death already? Or you're starving because you weren't at lunch? I know I'm starving at least, man. Ah, no, two questions. <laughs> Luxury. Um, hi, Kevin. Hi. Um, uh, one uh, of the consequences uh, when having a larger set of small libraries is to manage the dependencies. Yes. In, in, uh, in order to ensure that uh, uh, unwanted dependencies between the libraries uh, are being, uh, being created by no, uh, novice developers, for, uh, for example. Mm -hmm. How do you ensure that issue? Currently, so uh, you have some metadata uh, data in the library and uh, continuous integration scripting in order to ensure yeah. that uh, the architecture is safe. We, we are not yet at the point where we could raise a flag in the CI to say, oh, you did something wrong. Uh, that's something we're working on, uh, but it's not there yet. For the time being, we have, um, we have still uh, so not completely automated because you would have to look to actually see that something is wrong. But right now we have, um, in each of the frameworks, there's a file that we introduced, which is named uh, metainfo.yml. And in there, we declare what will be the tier and the type uh, of that framework, okay? And so that's obviously harder for the type because it's runtime dependencies, but for the tier, we then use that information and the dependencies as processed by CMake to generate diagram which will go in the API documentation. So we can quite quickly see, okay, that one is depending on something it's not supposed to depend on, okay? Uh, we'd like to, that's already much better than what we had before, and we'd like to move even to the space where we can actually um, automate the checking of, of that instead of having to look at diagrams uh, and raise a flag when something goes wrong. Thank you. 
Hi, Kevin. Hi. Uh, is there a support for Windows Planet for this framework, this new framework? For, uh, sorry, for I Windows, support for Windows. Ah, for Spend Windows, it. okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so far, the, basically the question of portability. So that's also something we're putting into the metadata attached to the frameworks. Uh, and so on the API documentation, you will be able to filter out, okay, I want to see only the ones which support Windows. And then that will filter out all the other ones. So that's also information we're carrying with the frameworks on which platforms they are supposed to work. Uh, we are also communicating uh, something which is a bit finer grained, like, okay, that works on Windows, but on Windows you would lose that feature, for instance, if that's something which would happen. So we communicate this kind of information. Um, and again, the idea is to communicate that upfront so that it's easy for someone to just shop for, uh, for some framework into the list that we, that we have. Um, Right now, I don't have the numbers in mind of how many of them are uh, running on Windows. Uh, the thing is, at least, for, uh, at least for the tier one, we should have 80% of them which are doing just pure cute stuff, right? So they run everywhere, cute runs, okay? Then there's a few where they are doing something which is platform specific and so on, and so that's one, uh, those ones we flag them as, okay, don't even bother on Windows, that's just, Linux for X11, for instance. Uh, another question. Uh, talking about KDE, the software, not the libraries, um, for the five version that is coming at the end of the year, I don't know, uh, is it right? <laughs> uh, well, so you're talking about Plasma, basically, which is our desktop, right? Yes, yes, okay. yes, yes. So for the next revision of Plasma, uh, they're not quite sure yet if they want to name it two or five or something else. Mm -hmm. so I can't answer that. Uh, I, think the, uh, I think the idea they have, but that might change. I mean, I, I'm working on the frameworks and not on Plasma, so I leave them the freedom to actually change their mind if they want to. Um, but I think their plan is basically to release one month after us. Okay, so if everything goes well, we have 5.0 on July, so August you should have uh, the next version of Plasma by KD. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. No question? Okay, so again, obrigado, and uh, please have lunch and don't starve for me. <laughs> <laughs>